What's up, guys? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. So today we have a special guest. This is Elliot from Marine Collectors. How's it going? Thanks for having me. <laughs> we have a mutual friend, Ryan from Bulk Reef Supply, mm -hmm. and that's kind of like who we met through yeah. initially. And so this is actually my first time ever really sitting down and talking with Elliot. Like uh, we had not met at a trade show before or anything like that. Yeah. So it's really good to, to finally meet you. I know that you don't necessarily travel a whole lot from L.A., <laughs> Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me out here. I'm super impressed by the facility. and Oh, thanks so much. You know, I'm enjoying the trip a lot. Elliot, how would you describe what it is you do? I would describe what I do as a expansion of my obsession for fish <laughs> um, and my means to play with the fish that I like to play with. What we do at Marine Collectors is we quarantine fish and we make sure that they're very clean and healthy and parasite-free before they leave the facility. We bring in... Yeah, hundreds of fish a week. So you're like a a boutique retailer and wholesaler yeah. of so fish? So Marine Collectors is a, I don't liken it to a business that sells fish. Like that is what we do, but it's more of a service company because the way that it works is you get an order online. I go specifically handpick a fish specifically for your order. We quarantine it, make sure it's healthy. We have this thing called a 14-day clean protocol, which means that the fish needs to be symptom-free for consecutive 14 days before we ship it. And if something arises, we restart the clock. So we're really more of a service company that is making sure that the fish are very healthy before they leave the doors. I can certainly appreciate that <laughs> because um, we here at Tidal Gardens are atrocious at bringing in fish and getting them through any kind of quarantine alive. It is like it is such a headache process for us. It's almost like a lot of our systems could use more fish mm -hmm. and they simply don't get more fish because the entire process of bringing in fish and then having a whole bunch of them just not make it that first 48 to 72 hours. It's a huge bummer. It like depresses the, the staff because like we don't want to see like, you know, sick and dying, struggling animals yeah. and all this stuff. So having a business that really specializes in exactly that yeah. is super valuable. Yeah, I will say that there are very few people, I think, in the industry that do fish very well. I think that there's a lot of people that gravitate more towards coral. Um, but I probably feel the exact same way about coral that you feel about fish. You know, I don't really do coral. Like, I think it makes a nice background for my fish, but if I have an angelfish that's hungry and it eats an LPS coral, I'm not really that upset about it. <laughs> it's it's kind of what they do. Yeah. Kind of what they do. You know, fish just having their normal natural behavior, eating what they might eat in the wild, like, I'm like, yeah, that is how that should be. You know, good for the fish. It's getting proper nutrition. Not the worst thing in the world, I guess. <laughs> I know to like anyone who keeps reef tanks, it's like, oh my God, that, you know, uh, well, Sophia was like a few hundred dollars. <laughs> so I'll tell you, like, not a, there's certainly certain types of corals that are, are growing faster than anybody can realistically sell them. Mm -hmm. And I think that there might be a future timeline where some of this stuff is just considered like a very, very good food source for obligate coralivores. Yeah. And then suddenly, like, really exotic butterflies become you know, more part of what you see in home aquariums. You know what? I actually really love those types of challenging fish. Like the entire thing about marine collectors is I like taking really challenging fish and I like bringing them in and figuring out what makes them tick, how to like really, really master that fish so that when we bring it in, I know definitively we can almost always be successful. You know, obviously there's going to be outliers because situationally just the way that the methods of supply chain and transport work, you know, not everything's always going to be as cookie cutter. It's just like getting, let's say, some dry goods, right? That not, mm -hmm. external factors don't really affect as much. But for the most part, I could tell you, like, our copper bands are a great example that I've figured that fish out really, really well. And now we lose, like, none mm -hmm. ever. And so typically for us, for getting it from a wholesaler, we expect to lose half, if not 75% of them. Yeah. They just, they never eat. And yeah. that's like the biggest problem. And we, we've had some sidebar discussions as to why they might not be eating. Very interesting because the there is a huge like disconnect in methodology between what Elliot does and what I do. Like mm -hmm. I'm very much a coral focused thing, obviously. 
But yeah, there's all all these little wrinkles that pertain to fish. Then yeah. he's just like, by the way, you're probably having this issue because the the food that you're getting, while a lot of stuff does eat it, and your corals will eat it, it smells like it's basically rotten out of the bag. So I'm like, oh, that's why it's a third of the price of everything else. Good to know. <laughs> yeah, because like, uh, so he, we were downstairs, and he, and he suggested that I get PE mice specifically. Mm -hmm. I have another source of mysis that is the same Canadian species. And sure enough, the two things smell differently. Like the PE mysis has no odor. Mm -hmm. And it was like really interesting that like the the copper bands that I got from Elliot, they do eat the PE mysis, but not the other Canadian mysis. So yep. yeah, they might all be the these... same species, but you know, like fish are temperamental. They have really good eyesight, really good sense of smell. All those things really play an enormous factor into getting them accustomed. And if you're thinking about a fish like a copper band, you know, you're taking a fish that really inspects its food, really stares at it for a moment before it eats it, right? That's the natural behavior of that fish in the wild. And if you take a fish that is so attentive to its food and then, you know, maybe there's something slightly off, it's probably not going to eat it, particularly if it's uncomfortable and it just came in from overseas and it's still not adjusted to captive life. Like things like freezer burn or how it was frozen, when it was frozen, that type of stuff. All, play All that enormous. handling stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, so the, these two shrimp might have come from the same lake <laughs> or not the same thing mm -hmm. once it's time to actually feed it. So yeah, very interesting stuff. I'm learning a lot of lessons. Uh, but let's talk specifically about the, the whole process of, of how you bring in fish and get them through quarantine. Yeah. Because... I have asked this question many a time to many a person that knows, mm -hmm. and the only consistent thing that I ever hear is that they're all different. Like there's, there, yeah. everybody has their own favorite methodology, and whenever I try some of these things that works so well for others, it doesn't necessarily work well for me. Yeah. So I'm again, so I'm, I'm, I'm very curious as to like how you specifically do stuff. So first, I'll say that I am in a uniquely beneficial position to be in because we're located in LA and every wholesaler is within a 15 minute drive from our facility. Um, I have the ability to go into the wholesalers or at very least I have the ability to go pick them up if, I, if they have to be ordered off a stock list. But for the most part, I can have direct access to wherever the fish are coming from. Uh, we do occasionally bring in shipments of fish directly from overseas. I try not to just because logistically it doesn't always make sense. Usually you have to justify a certain amount of freight requirements and we might not need an exuberant amount of fish from any one particular location. But for the most part, we like to source all of our stuff from local wholesalers. And over the years, I've really fine-tuned what fish we buy from what vendor, from what region. We don't have a lot of loss because we've narrowed down the proper sources for almost everything that we do now. Talking with other folks that do bring in fish and seemingly do a very, very good job of quarantining yeah. and, um, and minimizing losses, they've told me that, you know, sometimes the, the source of the fish alone dooms the fish. I take it all personally. I think yeah. it's all 100% my fault. They're like, actually, depending on where that thing came from, how it was handled, it might, you might never have actually had a chance with that animal. So I will tell you that the points at which fish get messed up, it's either during the time that it is being held overseas right after collection, it's during the acclimation once it gets stateside, or it's in the shipping after they've already been mishandled twice. So let's say that, uh, let's just say we're getting some fish from the Philippines, right? Mm -hmm. And you have a supplier that's sending a ton of green chromis, right? That's a really common fish. And... Those green chromis normally would go out every week or maybe every five days or whatever, but maybe this particular shipment, there was a storm or there was a delay in shipment. Those fish sat there overseas for three weeks instead. And then they were probably held in less than ideal conditions because usually if you're in the business of turning fish over and you're moving stuff, the conditions don't really need to be as optimal as you might expect just because the fish aren't sitting there, right? Mm -hmm. But that's like the first thing. It's like if you're already getting fish that were already weakened with suppressed immune system or whatever happens to be the case, the fish before they even get to the States are already 
you know, in a bad state. And then they're going into systems here that have fish from all over the world. And like, there's an enormous argument to be made about you don't necessarily want to mix oceans because different pathogens, different oceans, different fish, and all of a sudden you're putting everything together and you're exposing everything to everything, mm. you know. And then a lot of times it's how the fish are being held once they make it to a store or in a wholesaler's location. A lot of people run sub-therapeutic levels of medication like copper or it'll be that the salinity is really low. And all those things really are taxing on the body's or on the fish's body, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and none of this is really transparent to even somebody in the industry like myself that um, is able to get wholesale access to fish. I would have no ability to, to see back into that supply chain very yeah. easily. So I don't necessarily think that it's that the information's not there. I think it's more of it's not an obvious obstacle to most people. And I don't think that everyone thinks that the temperature shift or the salinity shift or the fact that the fish is sitting in a certain level of medication really matter because the fish is being moved and it just I think the perception of getting a new fish really changes the like expectation of okay this fish is already in this condition. I think when you get the fish initially you think okay this fish is probably perfect but the reality is, is that there's a very good chance that it wasn't or mm -hmm. it isn't and it's becomes a lot more about finding the consistently good sources mm -hmm. and like because you could have a really good source that maybe the shipments got delayed maybe the fish sat in the box for a little too long whatever and maybe that just batch of fish that shipment wasn't good just because maybe instead of a 36 hour transit time it ended up being 72 those types of things make enormous differences. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that you both do the quarantined mm -hmm. fish, and now you're looking at, at doing just some kind of like a like a, a lesser, I guess, a lesser degree of yeah, so of treatment, but it's still like screened. Yeah. So here's the thing: is we actually sell unquarantined and quarantined fish at the moment, and we may offer a conditioned version, which is like a halfway in between mm -hmm. fish. Uh, but the reason why is because a lot of people like to quarantine their own fish. You know, we did a ton of videos with BRS about how to quarantine, and I pretty much laid out my protocol of like, if you want to quarantine your own fish, this is what you do. Just, I'm about to ask you all the same yeah, questions. Yeah, <laughs> follow this, you know, step-by-step -step thing. You'll be successful at least 80% of the time, if not 90 or, you know, 100 and, uh, you know, assuming you start with a good fish, there's no reason that you should lose a fish in quarantine. A lot of people's aversion to quarantine is that it's super difficult. They think that every time they quarantine, the fish dies in quarantine. Mm -hmm. And that quarantine's this thing of, like, I'm putting this fish in jeopardy of trying to do this. Because I think that people have had that bad experience. Yeah. Where they, they, they are trying to do the right thing. Yeah. And it's like the patient died yeah. in the process. And, you know... Even for myself, if I quarantined a few times and every time that was the outcome, but yeah, I wouldn't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, just, you just get gun shy where it's just like, <laughs> I'm just going to put it in this container and if you live, you live, homie. Like That's that's the best I can do for you because if I do anything a little bit past that, the last five times I did this, killed the fish. So yeah, I could I could imagine how yeah. uh, doing it improperly or doing it on a weekend animal, it just got bad results. Yeah, well, I mean, the reason that we even contemplated because our entire brand is that we're quarantined and that everything that we sell is 100% quarantined and it's healthy and conditioned and everything. But the reality is, is that if you're going to do quarantine, do it once and do it really well. Mm -hmm. Like don't buy a quarantined fish for me and then go do the same protocol again, because the reality is, is that the protocol is incredibly abrasive to the fish and you don't want to be re-exposing a fish to those same medications when it doesn't need to be. Yeah. You know, um, medications like copper are chemotherapeutic in nature. Like if you were to compare it to a person, you wouldn't want to put someone on chemotherapy drugs if there's no reason to, right? Yeah. So, and for the most part, I tell people, like even when you're buying fish from us, because no quarantine is 100%, right? That just do like an unmedicated observation tank, just get the fish eating, make sure that it doesn't have symptoms for two weeks, then you should be in the clear. But the desire to medicate it twice is really unnecessary. 
Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess the the unmedicated. So I'll, I'll tell you what, there is, um, I could definitely see a benefit in just that level of, of diligence mm -hmm. uh, because whenever I was bringing in fish, sometimes it's, it's literally that first 24 to 72 hours of, of me doing nothing. Yeah. And it's like a lot of like, a lot of the fish that were going to die, die during that, that, that window. Yeah. And if you're able just to get the fish through that window doing very little, yeah. it's a huge benefit. I'll tell you, if you're always losing fish in that window, it's because of the condition that the fish came in. L likely. Yeah. Like we, and we, like, we talked about that, how it might have been doomed. Yeah. So like Marine Collectors has always done like a DOA thing. And we recently just extended our guarantee to 72 hours. Mm. And we have a 72 hour, like anything happens, the fish doesn't make it, just shoot us a photo, immediately credit you back, no questions. Um, but the reason why is like, let's just say that maybe that box got thrown around a little bit more than it should have, or it got delayed in FedEx or whatever happens to be the case. And at least now you know you're covered, but it's that 72 hour window. You know, that's exactly why we have that guarantee for that duration, because we're really confident that the fish, if it's going to bounce back, it's going to be within that window. Yeah. And usually if, if the fish survives 72 hours, yeah. it's a really, really good sign. Yeah. Assuming that it's eating. Yeah. Assuming that it's eating. Okay. So real quick, what are like the common diseases that you're really looking to treat for? So it's going to be ick, velvet, uranema, flukes, and brooklynellum. Those are the main five. Okay. If you can get rid of those five, I would say that you've probably already won like 90% of the battle um, in all cases across the board. Okay. Occasionally, you're going to have extenuating circumstances where you have maybe a virus because there's very little information, at least hobbyist level, that's applicable that we can treat fish for viruses. Because, you know, if I told you that fish had XYZ virus, what, what are you going to treat it with? There's no treatment for it. Just on the point of the viruses, mm -hmm. um, sometimes like when we get copper bands, they get those white nodule looking yeah, things. Yeah, like that... lymphocystis. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a virus, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they just like fall off occasionally yep. and... So lymphocystis is like, I would compare it to someone getting a pimple or acne or something. Okay. Yeah. It's epithelial buildup and it's, how should I say, incredibly insignificant. Like if you lose a fish from it having those symptoms, that fish was going to die anyways. Yeah. I think the worst I've ever seen was when we had a copper band that had one almost like blocking its mouth. Yeah. And it still fell off and mm -hmm. the, the fish was fine. So- uh, the symptom is basically just a buildup of skin cells that are clumping together, right? And that can, if it's just one isolated spot, sometimes it's even just like an injury and it's the fish's immune response was to go protect that area. So it's sending a bunch of extra like buildup. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you'll see like on the end of copper bands, mouth will kind of become a little bulbous and they'll mm -hmm. almost have that buildup and then it'll go away. Yeah. But a lot of times that type of thing will actually prevent the fish from eating because it's uncomfortable, right? But it's not something that is inherently detrimental. Like the virus itself is not going to cause the fish to die. Like mm -hmm. typically it's typically just a external, visually unpleasant thing. It's like a herpes outbreak. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you said uranema, brook, flukes, flukes, ick. Velvet. Velvet. Yep. Before we get into the procedure with the uh, with the medications and whatnot, yeah. uh, I do want to talk about just the design of a quarantine system, because um, this is very self serving. I want to do this better here. So, for somebody like me, uh, mm -hmm. and, and treat me just like as an advanced home hobbyist, because we don't bring in tons of fish for sale. Sure. We don't do that. But we want to bring in fish for our own tanks here because every now and again, a wrasse will jump. Every mm -hmm. now and again, a tang will like fall over dead from a heart attack. Like these things happen and I have to now replace a fish. Yeah. And it, again, it's this headache of like not killing fish you bring in. So can you describe um, like what you're looking to accomplish with a quarantine system? Is like an ideal size tank or anything? So I wouldn't say that there's an ideal size tank. Um, I wouldn't say that there's even an ideal system. I would say that there's an ideal protocol and you can apply it to whatever system 
the okay. um, or maybe an ideal principle. Um, the idea is you want to have a circumstance or a situation where you are keeping the water very, very clean uh, or the system, and you want to keep the fish very, very clean, and you want the fish to progressively get cleaner as it's you know the duration of quarantine goes on. And you could do this in a bucket, you could do it in a tank, you could do it in a full out blown system um, with a sump and skimmer and all that stuff, biological filtration. But the reality is that you don't need to do that. The gravitation that I have is keep the water as clean as possible. So change 100% of the water. Don't do like a 20% water change and think that the other 80% of the water that's still remaining isn't going to affect the fish. 100% water 100% change. 100% of the water change. Like we change, I'm sorry, we change over the entire warehouse twice a week at Marine Collectors. Like we go through so much salt and water and medication. But the reality is, is that fish can handle quarantine and those harmful medications that are really abrasive to the fish when they're in the right circumstances. And so when, when doing water changes that are that aggressive, that's mm -hmm. twice a week, 100%, you're effectively removing the need for like an active biological filter, it seems. So we actually have biological filtration on all of our systems. Okay. The need for biological filtration is not removed just because you're doing 100% water changes. Now, if it's a small enough volume and you're doing the water changes frequently enough, okay, you probably don't need biological. But if you're going to, let's say, do this in a commercial setting or you know that you're going to be quarantining a lot of fish, you know, if you have a really big tank at home and you're doing like a school of antheus or something, right, you might mm -hmm. want to have some form of biological filtration because the reality is that the amount of ammonia is going to build up so quickly. It's okay. It's a, it's a very yeah. fast acting, and it's going to it's gonna take effect before your next yeah. scheduled water change in like three so days. I would tell you that the rapidness of ammonia building up is almost instantaneous, whether it's at the levels that it's going to harm the fish, it's debatable. Mm -hmm. Probably depends on the water volume and the size of the fish and the system or whatever. But you're not doing the water changes for ammonia reduction. You're doing it for all of the other untestable stuff. Like fish are releasing all types of bodily fluids and stress hormone and all this other stuff. And that's the main reason that you're actually doing the water changes. The ammonia is just like one part of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just like uh, goes to the top of mind because it's, this is the, again, it's like you're thinking like new tank, it's cycle type stuff, ammonia being that toxic. Yeah. Um, so are it just big bio ball tower? Yeah, so like we have uh, like upflow bio ball towers at the Marine Collectors facility. Um, I haven't used bio balls since the 90s. It is a very old school form of tech. And you know what? It is the one scenario that I would say that that is the best filtration media. Okay. Because for most people, your quarantine is going to be a relatively like hands on situation. And you're not going to have the like nitrate factories that's normally associated with a bioball tower mm -hmm. in a quarantine setup, yeah. particularly if you're changing 100% of the water. Right. It'll yeah. just never build up. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. You know? But the great thing about it is that bioballs are plastic. They don't absorb medication. They don't give a ton of space for parasites and other things to hide. Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't mess with any of the things that are really important in quarantine. And you can treat it almost like a sterile substance um, or a sterile surface area just like the rest of the tank you know so like if you are going to dose something like formalin or some type of antibiotic or whatever that might um, you know be affected by other porous medias or like copper a lot of times it'll bind to calcium carbonate structure it doesn't happen with bio balls just because it's plastic there's nothing for mm -hmm. it to bind to i see it's like more inert yeah, exactly yeah. yeah this is already diverging from what we typically do. <laughs> yeah, so the principles in quarantine are, are not that of the ones you would apply to a display tank. Right. A lot of aeration? Aeration's great. I don't think you necessarily need to overcompensate with aeration unless you're using some type of medication that is depleting oxygen levels. Okay. If you're running Prozzi, definitely a lot of aeration. If you're doing formalin, a lot of aeration. If you're doing copper, normal amount of aeration if you're using a sump mm -hmm. is a protein skimmer in the sump enough aeration yeah. yeah okay definitely so it doesn't have to be like an active like air stone in the tank with the fish no three inches away if you have a skimmer on a quarantine tank it's probably more than adequate okay yeah good to know all right now maybe don't put like 
you know, a skimmer rated for 60 gallons on like 300 gallons of quarantine, but like appropriately sized. Okay. And you're not really even, I wasn't even thinking necessarily of it functioning as a protein skimmer, but yeah. just for like the, like a chamber of aeration for it. So the protein skimmer will serve as a function in terms of like pulling out all of the smaller particulate matter when you're feeding, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of keeping the water from getting less polluted. But it's not as important as it is on, let's say, like a display tank or an sure. active reef tank where it's you're trying to maintain this uh, ecosystem. You know? Right. Let's get into the actual treatment of diseases. Yeah. Now, uh, you mentioned before um, mainly copper is like your, your go-to. What does copper yeah. Directly deal with so copper is going to treat your protozoans so ick velvet those that's the treatment for those two which are probably on most fish mm -hmm. I would say that the majority of tanks have some underlying population of ick velvet if you forgot it more than likely everything's dead but never <laughs> knock on wood never had to deal with it I know and you've got an Achilles downstairs that looks really good so <laughs> it's it's it trust me it's luck. <laughs> got the luck-based protocol going on right now yeah um yeah copper is going to be the main form of solution or main form of medications that's actually in the system usually i like to couple that with nitrofurazone just because copper is a gill irritant and a lot of times if you have fish and copper they'll get secondary bacterial infections in the gills and nitrofurazone is a antimicrobial that'll kind of just keep is it on. like an antibiotic no it's not an antibiotic it's I've heard of it, but what, what is it? Uh, the common product that used to be on the market is Furan 2. Furan 2, okay. Yeah, yeah we, we've got a little container of that downstairs. Yeah, yeah, so it's the main component in Furan 2, which is nitrofurazone. It's like the pure form of it. I see. Um, that's using zoantha dips. So anyway, <laughs> that's, why, that's why I have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, anyways, antimicrobial just to like stave off secondary infection just from, you know, the abrasiveness of the medication. And then for the other three things, usually I treat those with formalin. Granted, formalin's not something that everyone wants to use. It's It was kind of concerning to me uh, because originally we were using formalin. And then uh, we, we were just hearing feedback from all sorts of people like, do you know how carcinogenic that is? And I'm like, not really. And we don't use it hardly ever anymore. Yeah. We, I, I really don't want to open that bottle. But from everything that I've heard from a number of folks that do very successful quarantine, yeah. they love formalin. Yeah, it's not something that should be taken lightly. And I would not recommend the use of formalin to someone in a home setting just because the benefit doesn't outweigh the risk. Yeah. It's incredibly useful, particularly for someone like myself who's in a commercial situation and we can use it to kill everything external, not mm -hmm. just some things it's also not going to just knock things off or suppress things it will fry them off the fish mm -hmm. and um so what yeah. is the dosage of uh, formalin that you're using so formalin has a mild range if it's a more sensitive fish you could do it at 0 0.08 or sorry 0 0.8 milliliters per gallon we typically are a little bit stronger so we do it at one mil per gallon one mil per gallon yep. okay the minimum duration is half an hour uh, okay, so this is like a dip. This yeah. isn't like a, I've got or a 20-gallon tank. Yeah. I'm just going to like pour it in there and just leave it in there forever. So you can. You can do a system dose as well. Oh. It's uh, one mil per 10 gallons if you're going to do a system dose. Okay. It's not as effective. We do them twice a week to the systems, but it is not for treatment of disease on the fish. It is primarily just to keep the systems clean. Interesting. It's... Yeah, it's so it's a dual application. So you could do, mm -hmm. do it as a specifically as a dip in a higher concentration, yep. lower concentration for just a system wide mm -hmm. treatment. And then you just let it run; it'll eventually gas off. Great. And yeah. <laughs> um, Sounds so convenient. There's a reason that I do all the formula myself, and it's after hours, and then I come in before everyone else. I aerate the building, and we have you know formaldehyde sensors in there to know that yeah. air is clean. So what what's the <laughs> what's the name of the formaldehyde sensor again? Uh, is this like Air Night or something? Yeah, something like K -N -I -G -H -T. that. K N I G H T. Yeah, you can find them on Amazon. They're not that expensive. I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that because I yeah. I want to know. Like we we run ozone here, yeah. and we have like like ozone sensors yeah. and stuff like that. Um, it is just like a safety precaution just to be able to at least detect it. So the thing is that formaldehyde's in everything. Mm -hmm. Like 
it's in plywood that your house is made out of. Yeah. And like, there's degrees of exposure. Yeah. There. Like if I'm Obviously, there's a, a difference. Of it, yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, I think that there's always going to be some amount of formaldehyde exposure, but the actual level that's needed to be harmful, it's nowhere near it. No. Okay. We're talking like uh, 0.0013 on the scale versus where it's toxic, it's like 0.16 or something. Okay. So we're talking hundreds of a degree versus tenths. Okay, that that's reassuring. Yeah. Because again, I, I was very hesitant to open up this bottle. The the sensors definitely have given me some peace of mind, and I'm so glad that I decided to get those tech, the te sorry, detectors, just because it's, you know, carcinogenic stuff. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be exposing employees or myself to it. A uh, gas mask. Yep, gas mask. So I wear one of those like full face, like Breaking Bad double. Uh... <laughs> we we bought one of those too. I think we've only used it once so far, but yeah, it's like yep. what firefighters use. Yep, exactly. And uh, you know, I change out the carbon filters. You know, the audience is like, once a month. are we still talking about just like trying to bring in like a yellow <laughs> tang and I got to go get a gas mask that's $400 yeah. <laughs> to handle no, formalin? Uh, this is in a commercial setting where I am doing it several times a week. You know? Yeah. At the same time, though, you know, protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah protect yourself. You know, I mean, I've got a, a shower in the facility <laughs> just in case. Like if there's a spill, I can go rinse off. Mm-hmm. You know, just in case, but yeah, definitely like to be on the safe side, particularly with harmful chemicals. So, and you're doing this dip how often? So you do a 14 day treatment. Yeah. And so, how many times are you dipping in formalin? So, typically speaking, before the fish leave the facility, the fish are going into at least three baths, usually four. Um, and the systems, regardless of the duration that the fish has been there, the systems get dosed twice a week, just routinely, just because we're doing that to keep the systems clean. Okay, and so backing up just a little bit, so so copper like the entire time, mm -hmm. and then you're doing the dips three to four times. Yeah. Okay. Did we talk yet about chloroquine phosphate? We haven't. Where does chloroquine phosphate fit into this model? So chloroquine phosphate, I really like. It's a great remedy for, I don't know what that thing is, let me throw this at it, and a lot of times it'll fix a lot of unknowns. It has been dubbed like this miracle treatment because it does treat for all five of those things that we spoke about earlier. The problem with chloroquine phosphate is that you're not able to test the therapeutic level throughout the duration of quarantine. Whereas you are with, with, with copper. With copper, yep. So you have an initial dose, and the dose could be from... 0 0.04 milligrams per gallon to 0 0.08, so there's a pretty wide therapeutic range. Usually I go for the middle just because sometimes it'll be too abrasive for some fish, sometimes it won't be enough. But um, try to shoot for the middle, 0 0.06 milligrams a gallon. It is expensive stuff. Uh, usually we'll mix a batch of water at that concentration, use it, and then as soon as the water either goes cloudy or it's been three days, we change 100% of it. That way mm -hmm. we know that there's not going to be this fluctuation because anytime that you have nitrifying bacteria or bacterial bloom, the medication is susceptible to biodegradation. Mm -hmm. And since you can't test for it, you don't know how much it's fluctuating. So you might be at therapeutic and then three days later, it's just below the line, you know, but you need to maintain therapeutic levels through the entire duration. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And the entire duration being two weeks. Yeah. Okay. And so this Minimum. is- Okay. And yeah. so this is where doing the 100% water change really does act, have an active reset. Yeah. So it's like built in reset. Yep. Whether it's copper or chloroquine, you know, the benefit of doing 100% water changes every few days, you're either, you know, maintaining the medication level that you can't uh, test for, or you are also, sorry, not or, but you are also maintaining good water quality that the fish are going to be able to handle whatever treatment you're doing. Interesting. With them. Nice. Uh, if you're doing chloroquine phosphate, though, just leave the chloroquine phosphate, and that's all that's in the actual quarantine water. Don't mix it with formalin. Don't mix it with copper. Don't mix it with antibiotics. Okay, so if they, if they wanted to do um, both copper and chloroquine, now you're talking about 28 days minimum. I would think that it's really unnecessary. You, okay. You might kill the fish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really, you. really overkill. So it's, it's, so it's, a, it's a one or the other, like yeah. personal preference. So fish that can't handle copper or chloroquine is the great like alternative. So so d real quick, yeah. What are those? So eels, boxfish, puffers, mandarins. Mandarins are actually usually okay in copper. Okay. 
Um, you could do anything that's scaleless that usually doesn't handle copper well. We'll okay. be fine in chloroquine. Uh, we typically will do rhinopheus or any of the lionfish in chloroquine just because they always die in copper otherwise. Oh. Um, it's been a while since I had one of those. Yeah, there's uh, this one specific ciliate parasite that comes out of Tahiti, so all of our Tahitian fish go through chloroquine phosphate as well, mm. just in case because it's, I don't know what it is. We had like eDNA testing done on it, and they're like, well, there's this, like 93% DNA match with a ciliate associated with shellfish aquaculture. And I go, oh, I guess that makes kind of sense. Like all the maximas come from Tahiti. Mm -hmm. Those same people are doing fish, like maybe whatever they're carrying. Just eating clams. Yeah, it comes from the clams. I don't know. Yeah. But the only thing that I've found that treats for it is chloroquine phosphate. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, chloroquine is a great thing. It is expensive. Copper's cheap. Slightly inaccurate just because you can't test for it and make sure that you're maintaining therapeutic levels, but I like it. It's It definitely has its purpose in the quarantine world. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, on UV during this whole process? No UV in quarantine. It'll either... So UV will break down chloroquine phosphate, and UV will also make copper very, very toxic. Okay. Yeah. So no UV. No UV. Okay. Uh, UV on a display tank, I think I'm indifferent. I think that it's great as a little bit of reinsurance, but I'm- I like it for water clarity. I, that, that's, <laughs> that's my number one goal. Yeah. I'm just, I'm in the camp of, I would rather know that the tank is sterile in terms of parasites and never introduce stuff and not have to rely on a UV to combat an issue or keep an issue at bay mm -hmm. um, though I know that that's not realistic for most people just because fish parasites can come on corals and snails and algaes and you know all this stuff food possibly if you're feeding live fresh foods yeah yeah like we freed manila clams and we go and get them from the grocery store we used to freeze them solid for 72 hours but now we do them for two weeks because apparently bacteria and all that stuff can live past you know 12 days or something hmm. at frozen solid negative 50. Oh, so, wow. yeah, just to be extra sure that they're absolutely clean before we feed them. But yeah, we go through like 20 something pounds of clams a month. Oh, wow. And uh, it's eat very, better than I do. <laughs> it's a very useful food, particularly for finicky fish. It's also a really good food for getting fish to put weight back on. So. Speaking of, um, what is your process for like trying to coax some stressed out fish to eat? Okay. So one, change the environment because most of the time the fish are not eating. It's because they're uncomfortable, not because the fish won't take to prepared foods. Um, like we can use the copper band as the example, right? It's a finicky fish. Most people have issues getting it to eat. I don't think that that's a fish that actually has trouble feeding. I think that if they come in in rough shape or they have some type of mouth damage or something other external, it'll cause that fish to not have the behavior of, I need to eat. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that fish is inherently always impossible to get to eat. Okay. So you're just saying like just to clean the, give it a cleaner space, so, less stressful. I know this is not applicable, but like our process is we keep the fish in dark tanks and we usually put those fish like 20 or 30 of them together. At that mm. population, they don't pick on each other, and they also have some sense of security. In the home environment, if it was me, I would black out the tank, you know, because a lot of times what will happen is fish like that, they're very shy, they're very skittish, they're very sensitive. and We've got one downstairs that's probably a little bit overstimulated and <laughs> not happy. Yeah, so. and like that's the type of fish that will... Oh, I, I walked up to the tank too fast. It spooked. All of a sudden, it hit its mouth. Now it's got mouth damage. Now it's not going to eat, mm. you know? And if it was me, I would take, like, let's say a 10, 20, 30-gallon tank, and I would either paint the sides or put some black trash bags on it or whatever just to black out the sides so it doesn't ram into the walls. Mm -hmm. the next thing I would do is only put a little bit of food in there at a time just because fish, if there's only 
one thing to focus on, like one singular mice shrimp at the bottom of the tank. It's not going to get overwhelmed by all the stimulus. And all of a sudden, it doesn't really feel the pressure to eat. If there's only this one food item and it's looking at it, and there's no other food items, it's a lot more compelled to eat. And if you have other fish and there's less available food, the natural like feeding response of competition, like I need to be the first one there, will also help develop a really strong feeding response. Do you experiment with a variety of foods for a lot of these guys just to try to find something that it will offer at? I used to. Okay. Not anymore. Um, I'm kind of at the point where I know that I can always get this fish to eat this food, and I just, you know, uh, like in my phone, I keep a notes app of every species, every protocol, every method to like, you know, this is what works. For feeding specifically. Not just for quarantine in general. Oh, okay. Um, but it'll be like, all right, you know what? This is going to be a perfect example. So like banded angels, right? They come from Hawaii. It's not a fish you can get anymore. I'll, I'll tell everybody just because it, it's a really good example. Banded angels, they're really sensitive when they usually first come in, usually because they're in rough shape. A lot of times they won't eat. Um, a lot of times they have a lot of gill flukes. But if you take that fish, regardless of the condition, and you put it in methylene blue for the first 24 hours, and then you put it into a system that has a pH over 8.1, you can get that fish to eat right away. Below 8.1, doesn't eat. Hmm. Um, clams versus an oily food like mysis shrimp always takes the clams. Doesn't really handle prosy that well, handles formalin really well. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I've kind of fine-tuned the process to where now I know all of those things for almost all the fish, mm -hmm. you know, and it's less about I need to figure out what fish will take what food because, you know, I know the gravit or the tendency is to gravitate towards, okay, well, you know, I have a finicky fish. Let me just give it this big smorgasbord of something to pick from like 20 different options when the reality is, is maybe only one of those is actually ever going to work consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, like our Moorish idols, our copper bands, I know that I can get those onto Pete Umysis directly. Um, I know that I can get Purple Queen Antheus or Ivancy Antheus onto uh, live baby brine. And then I can, once they've developed a feeding response, I can get them onto the dead version of it. Once they're on the dead version, I can get them onto the, um, oh, what's the, oh, sorry, I'm blanking on the name. It's another food that, uh, Piscean Energetics makes calanus. That's what it is. Oh, I don't know. It's a really small particulate frozen food, but you know what? That's something that everyone can go store by. It's accessible. Just feed them that a few times a day, and eventually they're also going to take to other stuff too. Interesting. But okay. with every fish that there's a process for, usually I kind of can tell what will work, and I don't need to try all the other things because in the process of trying all the other things, a lot of times you're just polluting the tank. Mm -hmm. And that's not what you want to do because you want to keep really clean. Is this sort of information available typically? No. Um, I mean, if you call us up, I'm happy to tell you. But over hundreds of fish, I haven't put that information out there. That, that would make for a great website, actually. <laughs> that would be a wonderful resource. Yeah. It's um, uh, honestly like I'm totally fine sharing the information. It's just a matter of I don't have the time because I work 20 hours a day already. Yeah. And like to go and type up all this, like, if you want to be successful with this one specific species, then do that hundreds of times. I just. So the, the last time I wanted to do a podcast with somebody specifically about fish, mm -hmm. there are, it's like this like l branching logic tr decision tree. Sure. And it just spidered out of control because I was like, I was taking notes about all this. And it's like, I can't record this. Yeah. Like this is there because everything gets so granular, so fish specific, yeah. so application and scale specific, mm -hmm. scale meaning like the size of the operation type yeah. thing that it was just like overwhelming it was completely overwhelming and it's like i don't know how useful this is for just about anybody because i'm like like i'm having a hard time processing exactly yeah. how i would implement a lot of this and the home of hobbyists a lot of them don't even have a secondary tank to even do quarantine in yeah so it, it's it's really tough to kind of like <laughs> navigate all these different uh, different things so yeah like the the, the simplest thing that can actually be executed yeah 
uh, hopefully that gets you past 80, 90 percent of all the issues. So I do think that it is because I'll just tell you, like, even for myself, giving out definitive information like do this and then wanting that to be the blanket statement, it, it's not there because if I tell someone, hey, do this, and then they spread that information around, that information not might not work for everybody. Yeah, like I, I always, uh, when it comes to just how to do reef aquariums, yeah. there's a lot of ways to do it successfully. Exactly. Yep. And, and I always say, like, if somebody is doing it a certain way and it's working for them, do not change it because it's contradictory to what I had said in a video. You make sure you keep doing what works for you. Yep. Uh, but... Definitely, I have a lot of room for improvement when it comes to bringing fish in, getting them healthy, and getting them into our systems. Hopefully, pest free, alive. If right now is good enough, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's like I since like we've been talking, there's like so many things that that I uh, I think that I can do better here when it comes to fish. Yeah, I mean, look, my way is not the only way. I am not the only person in the world to be successful with fish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. It's just I know what works and I stick to it. I try not to make things overly complicated because otherwise I'm less likely to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's a big deal. It's like if, yeah. if it becomes a really difficult to do, it's much more likely that it's not going to happen. Yeah. So anyway, that kind of like completes this little segment on like the quarantine intake process. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the information. Of Hope course. you guys learned something and I'll see you all next time. Happy reefing.